So in this video today, we're going to be looking at an electrical insulation condition report, okay? And maybe the reasons why we need to undertake an EICR, as we call it for short. Now, generally in a domestic dwelling, you're probably going to do an EICR maybe before a board change, okay? So you're going to do some test inspecting to make sure there's no issues when you add new devices to a board chain, such as RCBOs, RCDs, that you're not gonna get any unwanted tripping. Also, generally you're gonna be doing it maybe for, let's say a letting agent, okay? And what they're gonna do is they're gonna ask you to come in and perform an EICR due to the private rented sector changing its requirements in terms of electrical safety. They're probably all mocked up by now, but I'm sure there's still a few out there that haven't been done, very naughty. So. They're, they're some of the reasons why we're going to maybe need to undertake an EICR. Now, today's EICR we're doing is actually slightly different, okay? The insurance company for the customer has asked for an electrical safety check of certain parts of the house because what's happened is their water cylinder has actually cracked and caused certain areas to flood in the house and water has obviously come through parts of the electrical system. So they need one of these done for the insurance company so they can start the ball rolling with the work. Now, this is where it can get a little bit awkward sometimes because within an EICR, some people believe that you need to 100% test everything, 100% inspect everything, and that's the only way to do it. Now, it's not always the case, and this is where it's really important as an electrician that on our paperwork on the very first page, um, which is often looked past maybe um, when filling out, is really important that we cover the extent of the electrical insulation that is covered and we do that quite importantly just to the areas affected. Don't get me wrong while I'm here, we may sample other areas just to look to see if we need to look further, okay, but sampling will come in a different video. Once we've, we've looked, we're going to obviously massively heavily inspect this, okay, there will be some testing involved but generally because of water damage we're going to be looking at the inspection side and again it's very important on that paperwork that the reason for the work required okay and there's a nice box there you can see on the screen is actually going to be due to a safety assessment needed by an insurance company okay and we've just got to make these things really clear there is going to be certain things we can't check okay there will be limitations again limitations are fine as long as they're agreed before the work is undertaken okay you will get operational limitations from time to time but it's very important you agree these limitations with the client i know a lot of electricians don't like the the symbol if you like that is lim on a an electrical insulation condition report but again as long as these are are set in stone before you undertake the work then there's nothing wrong with that okay the paperwork is very important to sort of cover yourself as an electrician okay so so actually these are the things I was here to look at and these are what I looked at and not necessarily someone saying well you put on there that you're 100% tested and inspected everything but then you've put you're just doing the area affected by the flood because you've sort of contradicted yourself so it's very important that we get our paperwork right especially that first page and it is very important especially with an EICR it's important with the other certificates but with an electrical insulation condition report remember I used the word report there it's not actually a certificate, okay? This is a report. So this is our professional judgment on how safe an installation is as it stands. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go look at the installation, okay? We're gonna start some of the inspection process and some of the testing process. So we've made our way to the consumer unit now, okay? Just to see what we've sort of got in the installation, what circuits we have. And as you can see straight away, we have a code there. Now, this is what I was talking about. Even though this is not an affected area, okay, by the flood, I'm still required to come here and check the consumer because I'm going to be doing some testing from here, maybe insulation resistance testing, and we can still code this, okay, because we have checked this part of the installation, therefore, this needs coding. It's not like, oh, I'm only, ch I'm only checking the, the flooded area, so I can ignore this even though I've seen it. It doesn't work like that. We still have a duty of care, okay, for the things we see that we can note down or code. I will actually fix this while I'm on site because it is just a consumer unit blank needed for safety. As you can see, we've got some circuits turned off. So that might indicate to me straight away that actually these, these circuits have been affected by water in some way and I'm required to check these. We've also got some, which I can see here, lighting, okay, and they're actually switched on and switched on in the affected areas. So it gives me a good indication that there's, the water's probably dried out a bit by now, and it isn't causing any issues with unwanted tripping for 
the relevant RCDs. So this is one of the areas affected and you can see actually the extent of the water damage across the whole of the ceiling. We have lighting points there. Now what I actually did when I first came in just to look at this water damage is I flicked the lights on. So once I flick that one on, you can see there's obviously an issue and you can actually hear a little bit of sparking. And we have a lot over there, which seems to be fine from a visual inspection just from down here. Now actually when we look at this light, we can see that it has an LED lamp, okay? And you can actually see the water, if I wiggle that a little bit, you can see the water inside the lamp. So my guess in there is the accessory is probably fine. However, the light, the lamp itself, or the bulb, don't tell me off gas, is actually what is causing the issue there in terms of the light flickering and the little bit of sparking we can hear. As you can see here, this is the, the culprit here. So this tank has decided to split, causing this blood. You can see the damage to the carpet, etc. Again, it's in the switched off position. So I'm doing an insulation resistance test to count the affected lighting circuit for downstairs. When I first tried to do it, I was getting low readings. Um, so I tried linking line and neutral together to CPC um, to see if there was any, obviously to bypass any loads in the circuit, still getting low readings. So I then went and disconnected all loads. So I took all the loads out and I've actually switched things out of circuit just to give me an idea of, of, of where we're going with it. Things like extractor fans and stuff like that. And as you can see, I'll just test between CPC and line and neutral. And when I test it at 250 to start off with, lots of low reading. So I did also try and disconnect the CPC from the MET up here, just to see whether um, that would make a difference. Um, but no, nothing at all. So we're gonna have to further investigate that on the report and we'll clearly state that it's further investigation. We're not here to fault find at the minute just to ascertain the condition of the system. So therefore we will note it as an FI and then that will require us to do some further investigation. It might be that actually when we start going to do some more inspecting, we might find lots of water sitting in an accessory or something like that. So I'm further inspecting the lights, okay. Unscrewed the rows. If you look in the top, actually there's a lot of water still in there so this could be one of the reasons for our bad insulation resistance again we'll have to go back and recheck um, once we've checked all the lights in the affected area so i'm visually inspecting all of the accessories in this main affected room here and as you can see doesn't look to be any damp in these also one way of sort of telling is all of this original debris and dust from when it was second fixed you can see isn't all clumped together um it's still pretty fine it doesn't look damp at all it doesn't feel damp plasterboard feels very dry as well um yeah it doesn't look to be any signs of damp in there so checking the last point now um and again no signs of damp in here however just to show you an example of what the contract has done. Now this wall here um, actually is side by side with another property. Okay, so it's attached to the next property. So what they've added in here, if you can see, is actually some sort of intermessent pad. Now I'm not sure whether it's for fire rating or soundproofing pad itself. But again, just to show you the different sort of ways of doing things in terms of the building regulations, this would be. And as you can probably tell now, I'm actually in the kitchen, okay? Now, if we look at the ceiling again, just visual clues, doesn't seem to be any water damage to the ceiling, which is usually a, a visual indicator that actually this room is not necessarily been affected. But again, as I stated at the start of the video, I will sample things downstairs, especially where water could have run into accessories. And depending on what I find from a couple, I can then either be satisfied that actually it hasn't made its way through the petition down into accessories, let's say in the kitchen. But also I can then, if, if let's say I took this cooker switch off and oh, there was a bit of damp in there, then what I could do is increase my sampling size and I could actually say, well, I'm gonna look a bit further into it now as part of this EICR because I'm not satisfied with what I've seen 
so far. I can't use my professional judgment to say, well, actually, 25% of accessories in this kitchen that I've visually inspected have been absolutely fine. Therefore, I don't need to increase sample size. However, the 25% may have had issues. Therefore, I would say to myself, right, I'm going to increase that to 50% and see what that extra further 25% brings up. But as you can see, again, doesn't seem to be any major signs of damp in here. And again, the power's all off now. Just have a feel on the plaster board is a, usual, a, a visual indicator. And you can see there. Again, the, the signs of dust there, that's not all clumped up together, um, is usually a sign that it hasn't had any water damage to it. In the, in the hallway now, um, there's a smoke detector again. This is why we sample. So you wouldn't expect by looking at the scene that there's actually massive water damage in this area. But when taken off the smoke detector, you can see that it's definitely been affected by water. And also the connections there have been as well. So pretty much come to the end of the RCR now. Why I'm only wearing one glove, I don't know. Let's get the other. So now we've pretty much come to the end of the RCR. And remember, we didn't do a full inspection and test of the whole property, okay? We just looked at the affected areas, which we visually looked at with the, the damage to the ceiling, etc. So it gave us an, an indicator, and then we sort of built off of that, really. So checked areas down here anyway, because the leak was coming from upstairs. Didn't have to check the upstairs lights or anything like that. Still, it's a split load board, therefore still tested the RCD on both. So little bits of that circuit you could argue we've tested in terms of the RCD. We obviously had the issue with the lights. Once we, once I got rid of that, um, I actually got an acceptable value of like 2.28 mega ohms. Still not great. It was still sort of jumping about a little bit. Um, so I've disconnected the light and left it there to sort of dry out. Um, there's obviously lots of work to be done here anyway in the future, so we'll get them changed. I'll still recommend um, other accessories on the ceilings to be changed, especially the smoke detector, again, filled with water. There was definitely water on the connections as well. So, yeah, we've, we've visually inspected everything. Remember, it's always important not just to test, but to visually inspect stuff as well, and vice versa. Um, and make sure when you're filling out your paperwork that everything we've done today is clearly stated on the paperwork. So somebody doesn't see, oh, he's give that installation 10 years because I haven't tested the whole installation. So actually the, the period I give will just be for the circuits that I've touched. And again, we sampled in the kitchen. The kitchen light was fine. We sampled in the kitchen sockets. They were all absolutely fine. Um, the cooker, therefore we didn't have to go any further really. Still tested the water heater circuit. And um, even though the, the final connections are up in the cupboard and there was no water damage in there, because that has caused the issue, I've still decided to test that circuit as well just to ensure the electrical safety, the home insurance company might need it, you see. So yeah, from that point of view, what we're gonna do is advise on what work needs to be done. The customer can then send that to their, their home insurance and we can go from there. As always, we hope this video has been some help.